you're familiar with us, but for those who are the first time here, I'd still like to briefly introduce Tashu to you. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2015. Dashu promotes research and education in data sciences. I personally really like the name of Dashu. It is a pun in Chinese. If it is written as Dashu, the first set of characters here, it means large numbers, as in the law of large numbers. Or we could also translate it as big data if we want to hit one of the buzzwords nowadays. If it is written as the second set of characters here, it means big tree. There's an old saying in Chinese says that if we plant a tree today, uh, then many future uh, generations will be able to enjoy the shade under its canopy. So this is exactly what we do today. Uh, Dashu collaborate with academia and industry. We organize scientific conferences. We host educational opportunities for students and working professionals. We provide training sessions and career development tips. We lead and engage discussions and provide communication channels for professional engagement and popular topics. We welcome you to the community and hope you can grow with us. The membership is free. To join the mailing list for upcoming event notifications, please send an email to info at dashu.org. We always welcome new volunteers to join us. If you are interested, please go to our website, find the volunteer tab. There you can send us a message uh, directly through the system. We also welcome donations. All of the money are used, uh, will be used in place. Donations are allocated according to a strict financial system and all documents and data are collected and recorded comprehensively. And the administrative costs are minimized to less than 3% of all the donations. Okay, today uh, here we are very grateful to have Dr. Patrick Bankert from Samsung SDS America with us to talk about automated image labeling for medical imaging AI. Patrick has the AI engineering and AI sciences team at Samsung SDS America, and he's responsible for Brightix AI Accelerator, which is a distributed machine learning training and automated machine learning product. Patrick and his team run a YouTube channel where you can find interesting content related to AI, case studies and demos of the product. Also, Patrick has contributed to the education of data sciences by writing books and short articles. Books include machine learning and data sciences in the oil and gas industry, optimization of industrial problems. Some short articles such as the role of domain knowledge in data science, screening for COVID using computer vision and guidelines for ethical AI can be found on his LinkedIn page. Before joining Samsung, Patrick spent 15 years as CEO at Algorithmica Technologies, with, uh, which is a machine learning software company serving the chemicals, oil, and gas industries. Prior to that, he was assistant professor of applied mathematics at J Jacobs University in Germany, as well as a researcher at Los Alamos National Laboratory and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Lastly, Patrick obtained his machine learning PhD in mathematics and his master's in theoretical physics from University College London. As a German native, Patrick grew up in Malaysia and the Philippines, and later uh, he lived in UK, Austria, Nepal, and USA. He has done business in many countries and believed that AI must serve humanity beyond the mere automation of routine tasks. Patrick now lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with his wife and two children. All right, can't wait. Let me hand it over to Patrick now for the story behind active learning, a technique which significantly reduces human efforts in medical image labeling, which is known to be a very expensive field. Um, a friendly reminder for our audiences is that please make sure yourself is muted while the talk is going on. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts, please post them in the chat box and we will have them answered after the presentation. Um, so Patrick, I will stop share now and feel free to share your screen and unmute yourself at any time. Great. Well, thank you very much, Wang. I think that was the very best introduction I've ever had in my life. Uh, nice pictures, well-researched, very kind of you. Thank you uh, for that. Um, thank you for being here.
Uh, thank you for having me. So, and of course, thank you to all uh, 88, uh, 89 people who've shown up here um, from various time zones. Um, if, if you're from California, good morning. If you're from the East Coast, good afternoon. Um, I hope you have a nice lunch. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me to, to speak here. Yeah, I'm Patrick. You've just heard uh, my intro. So I'm a mathematician and currently work for Samsung SDS, which is the um, IT services organization within the Samsung group of companies. And uh, I'm in charge of the AI department here where we do many types of modelings. And um, today I'm gonna talk to you about our effort in medical imaging. And um, I would like to share um, some slides with you. Now, of course, I don't know um, exactly what everybody's background is. There might be a, a mix of backgrounds in the audience. So I'm gonna just take you through the journey from A to Z. There might be a few things you already know, but um, I hope that there'll be some few um, you know, foods for thought. So just to start off with, um, I wanna illustrate that there are multiple applications of what's called computer vision. Um, so basically image processing using artificial intelligence. Um, and these are the four major use cases. There are others of course, that are more specialized uh, to particular applications, but these four words you see a lot. So classification, the top left here, um, really addresses the point of, um, is the image part of a certain category um, or, or a different uh, category, right? So the entire image is placed into bucket A or bucket B. Um, then if we go on to detection, which is the, the top right image here, now it's a matter of putting a rectangular bounding box around a particular object and saying, this is an object of type A, B, C whatsoever. So in this particular example here where we have sheep, we either say, okay, this image has sheep on it, it's classification. And on the other hand, here are three rectangles that actually give the boundary around a particular sheep. And there happen to be three of them on this image. Uh, the, sorry, Patrick, I have to yeah. uh, remind you that you are sharing the presenter mode. Would you like to maybe share? Oh, I'm sorry screen? about that. Um, uh, sorry about that. Uh, let me see what I can do about this. Well, that's okay if... Um, I mean, the slides is big enough. We can see the front very well. Is this better? Yeah, that's much better. Uh, okay, I, I, I apologize. Um, there's no always some hiccup. Um, there, yeah, there has to be a that. hiccup, right? <laughs> yeah, we know that. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, so uh, segmentation is, is the next uh, challenge, which comes in two flavors. Um, one is called semantic segmentation, where you're drawing a complex border, a polygon border around the outside of the class. So in this case, sheep is the class. So you would draw a border around all the sheep uh, and around all the other things grass and road in this example. And instance segmentation is where you would draw a border around every instance of, of that class. So these are the four um, major uh, examples of, of image data labeling that you would need to do in multitude of applications. So definitely you've seen these images before in the context of road images where uh, you're labeling this is the road and here are some cars and see here are some pedestrians and maybe you have a dog and things like this are detected in order to help cars to see the road and to see what, what is there. So in the context of autonomous driving, that becomes popular. But you find the same sort of situation in medicine. 
um, which is the context that, that I want to talk about today. Um, so in medicine, you see images that are like this. Um, multiple technologies yield multiple types of images. Uh, so we're all familiar, for example, with the x-ray. I presume everybody has had themselves x-rayed at some point. Um, so at the top left, you see uh, an x-ray image of somebody's lungs. So this is a, a chest x-ray. And in the lung, you can then see, is there maybe buildup of mucus? And um, certain lung-based diseases, COVID-19 obviously is the most famous one now, or pneumonia, um, they have certain deposits in the lungs and you can see visually based on that mucus buildup which disease it is. So you can detect COVID-19 based on a lung x-ray. Um, and, and in fact, my, my group has developed AI models to do that. So if you arrive at the hospital and you have trouble breathing and uh, you have symptoms of maybe COVID or pneumonia and you're not sure, and the hospital doesn't know what medicine to give you, um, the swab test um, takes some time. It needs to go to the lab. And, and during that time, you lose time in, in treating the patient. So you could just quickly take an x-ray and then immediately know uh, with a higher accuracy, whether or not that person in fact has COVID or pneumonia. And in order to do something like that, um, somebody needed to, first of all, take all the x-rays and then uh, somebody needed to label the x-rays. And what does labeling mean? It really means um, manually going over the image and shading in an area saying, this is the mucus buildup over here on the lower left-hand corner. And this is mucus that uh, looks like COVID, or this is mucus that looks like pneumonia. And then having generated a data set like this, present it to a computer vision AI system, deep learning, and create an artificial intelligence model that then detects that this particular image is of a COVID patient. So that's what you see in, in the top left image here. Um, and it's the same for the other types of medical image technologies. You see a CT scan of somebody's brain where we can find the tumor in the brain that again, somebody had to shade in and say, this is where the tumor is. Um, on the top right hand side, we have a microscopic image. So this is where a biopsy is taken uh, from a tissue sample. And then a, a microscope looks at the cellular level and you take a, a picture, a photograph of that, um, of that microscopic um, sample. And uh, you detect here which cells are normal cells and which cells are cancerous. So you can determine breast cancer um, you know, is it breast cancer? Is it not? Uh, where is it? Um, kind of a thing. And um, on the bottom right hand, uh, that's, an, that's an image of a person's colon. Uh, you can detect colon cancer um, on, the, on the walls of, of the colon. So you see multiple applications using multiple technologies. And you could have put MRI scans or ultrasound images here as well, um, where you can detect um, things. So this is where deep learning or computer vision comes to medicine and, and helps out. Now, in order to actually create an artificial intelligence model that is able to do some of these things that I've been talking about, we need to go through a process. And that process, in my personal view, um, looks like this. And this, this is the process we go through at, at Samsung to create AI models for a particular application. So it's a seven step process that has five steps of mathematics um, or, or data science and, and two steps of communication. So <clears throat> at the beginning, there comes what I call communication, which is really defining what's the problem. And so this is the point where uh, the doctors educate the data scientists about what is breast cancer as opposed to other types of cancer. Um, what, what's, what's it look like, roughly speaking? Uh, how do you recognize it? Um, you know, what do you need to do? Okay, you need to take a biopsy. You need to make a whole slide image. It gets scanned. This is huge resolution. Things like this are, are communicated so that the 
the data scientists know what they're getting themselves into. Some basic design criteria are put into place about how the, how the clinical trials are gonna work out, how many subjects we need to, uh, to get for the study to work out, things like that. Then of course, there's a data acquisition stage at which point the actual data is acquired. At this point, um, of course, in medicine, you have to go through a, a large number of people, of patients, uh, generally of people who have the disease and, pe and some people who don't have the disease so that you can compare. Maybe you need uh, several types of disease to be represented so that you can tell type A from type B um, of, of the disease. So you need to be careful that you acquire the correct data and in the correct amounts as well. You don't want to overrepresent one category and underrepresent the other. Um, this is always a danger um, when data scientists are not involved in the data collection process because um, acquiring data from people who do not have a disease is always a lot easier. Um, these data sets that tend to be collected by, by medical professionals without data scientists tend to be very overly, uh, overemphasize the normal case. Um, but after we've uh, acquired all the data, then comes the second step of data labeling, which is what I've illustrated in the previous slide is basically a doctor going in and shading in a certain area or drawing a bounding box around a certain area or saying that the image belongs to a certain category. So this is labeling also called annotation where the domain expertise of the human doctors is inserted into the data set and the data set is augmented uh, by that, that knowledge. Following that um, then comes the step of feature engineering which is where the data scientists take over and say, okay, I'm now going to try to find the right features from uh, this set of data that, that I've got that most closely corresponds to the thing I'm trying to diagnose. Um, now feature engineering is, is known uh, in data science mostly to be associated with tabular data, data of numbers like time series or, or you know, database tables. Um, but feature engineering is extremely relevant to image processing as well, to deep learning. Uh, it's just the features look different. Um, there you're, you're talking about um, basically pre-processing by uh, you know, an auto encoder that, that effectively changes the, the resolution or looks for certain characteristics um, in, in the image, uh, like shapes, uh, shapes of certain sizes and, and whatnot. So feature engineering is, is quite important here as well. Um, this is followed by a model selection and hyperparameter tuning stage. Um, at this stage, you're selecting what is the right kind of model that you're going to use. Um, you know, how many layers is it going to have? How many units per layer? How big are these layers? Um, what are the hyperparameters that the algorithm uses to train um, all of this? Um, like the batch size and the learning rate and the holdout patterns and so on and so forth. These are uh, all parameters that are typically tuned um, to, to yield the best outcome. Ultimately, once, once you've done all that uh, selecting and tuning, you can then train the model for real. And then ultimately, of course, use it at inference, which means deploying the model in, in a usable real life case um, of course, that inference usage usually involves uh, a certain packaging of the model, which, you know, uh, in, entails data acquisition in real time, execution of, of the model, and then delivery of the result in some sort of manner that can be used by a practitioner. So in our case of medical imaging, it basically means taking the model and putting it into the actual imaging device. So you would want your, uh, your lung x-ray model to live inside the x-ray machine so that the x-ray machine doesn't only produce a picture, it also produces the diagnosis. Or you would wanna put your, your CT brain tumors uh, model in the CT scanner machine. 
um, or the MRI machine or the ultrasound machine and so on. So that there needs to be a collaboration between the data scientists and the manufacturer of the device. So inference is not, not easy in, in that sense because you have to have the, the right delivery vehicle. At the end of the process comes change management. <clears throat> it's, it's a personal pet peeve of mine, this change management aspect, because uh, this is really where most of the AI projects fail. Um, so that's, that's just one of, one of the take home lessons um, for, for all of you. Um, if you go through the entire data science journey and you end up with a model that's accurate and representative and statistically significant, and it all works out very well, and its computation time is fast and it fits into memory and everything has worked out beautifully, but the users at the end don't like it or don't accept it because like, it doesn't have a green button that does that or because they weren't part of the journey and weren't able to voice their opinions or because they simply don't want to change from the status quo, then the model is lost. So change management is the most crucial aspect in, in my opinion of the entire process, um, even though it's not part of doing the mathematics. Now, having said all this about the process, um, part of the point is that the distribution of labor for humans uh, across that journey is not the same. Namely, most of the work in my personal uh, observation, about 80% of the human labor that goes into the AI process is at the beginning, is dealing with the data. Um, so this is, this is classic data acquisition, data science, that's where all the human work lies. And the following steps, the three steps of uh, artificial intelligence of mathematics, those are the steps that really take a lot of computer time. Um, it also takes some human time. Uh, that's the other 20% of the human time. Um, but it really takes a lot of computer time. Um, because you constantly have to go through a trial and error process. So you come to the computer and say, okay, let me try a learning rate of this much and hit the enter button. That required very little of your time, but it's gonna require the next 48 hours uh, of your GPU machine to actually execute and then come back to you and, and, and tell you what the result is only for you to uh, try out yet another learning rate. Um, so that's something to be aware of that the time delay due to computing time happens at, at that later uh, part of it. Now, time delay is time delay. Uh, you can rectify much of that by doing auto ML, which is why I labeled those three steps auto ML. Um, that's a, a series of techniques that are available these days in a multitude of different software packages by different manufacturers. Um, and you can very significantly cut down on the total amount of time it takes to do all of these three steps by doing auto ML enabled AI on a sufficiently powerful machine slash collection of machines if you do distributed uh, training. So it, the, the, the onus is really in the data labeling part. Yeah? Data labeling uh, costs a lot of effort. Um, and especially in, in medical uh, cases, it takes a lot of effort because the labeling has to be done by not just anybody, but it has to be done by medical doctors. Um, medical doctors are obviously highly educated, highly experienced, and so they are a rare commodity and they are expensive and they should rather be treating patients because uh, they're, they're, they're busy people who, who ought to be doing what they were actually trained to do, which is to help people. So having them label images is not the best use of their time. Now, the crucial idea behind um, active learning, which is the technique that I'm gonna be discussing today, is really that the order in which you label images matters. State of the art today 
is that you have a large data set and you simply label all of it. And because your intention is to label all of it, the order does not matter to you. Um, no matter in which order you label it, you're gonna to have to label it all. So who cares in which order you do it? Well, hang on. Because the amount of information that a single image contributes to the collective is not always the same. Consider that you have two images that are uh, very similar to each other. Then the first one you label provides information and the second one doesn't provide any more information because you've already labeled its very similar sibling at an earlier point. But in a large data set like 100,000 images, a million images, you just don't notice near duplicates like that. So we ought to really sort them in the order of information gain because then we can stop labeling at a point that is sooner than having labeled everything. We can only label part of the entire data collection. Um, mind you, we don't know how big that part is yet, but I'll get to it. So that's the crucial idea. Sort the images in the order of information gain, label manually only the ones that are really informative, and then forget about the rest. Okay, it's a great idea, but we don't know how to do that sorting. Okay, fair enough. But let's, let's try to find out. And finding out the right sorting um, is what active learning is all about. And this, this is how it's done. So at the beginning, um, at the top left of the image here, we have a data set. This is your raw data set unlabeled at this point. Um, and you perform then an initial ranking. This is an unsupervised technique. Um, uh, we call it unsupervised feature learning, um, which gives you an initial uh, guess at what images are gonna be most informative. It's essentially a measure of difference. Um, the most different images are the ones likely to provide the most information at the very beginning. Having done that, you take the most informative, quote unquote, images and label them first. You label one batch. Now, one batch is an amount of images that you can label in a day. And it obviously depends on how many people you have available to label, right? If it's just one person, a batch is a very small quantity. It might be 100 or 200 images. If you have multiple people available to label, then a batch might be slightly larger. But batch is something that is not constrained by the mathematics. The batch is something that's constrained by your organizational ability to actually label. Uh, it's the amount you can get done in a, in a working day. Having labeled that batch, you give it to the active learner. Now the active learner is an AI system that does not try to actually diagnose the disease. Um, so it's not the AI system that you wanna end up with at the end of the day. The active learner merely tries to learn the sorting on the images. It doesn't learn image recognition. It, its output is an ordering. So it's effectively a, a rank score for every image in the entire data set that ranks it in order of information gain. So the output of the active learner is a ranking of the images and a confidence score that tells you how confident the active learner is about its ordering. Right? Um, in the beginning, of course, the active learner will be not very confident about the order because it has little information. Um, later on, it will become more and more confident. So if the accuracy of the active learner uh, is being assessed here and it's not yet good enough, no, we have to continue by labeling one more batch, by training the active learner again, by re-ranking and re-certifying if the accuracy of the active learning is good or not, and keep going 
until at some point the accuracy is good. Yes, and we can stop the manual labeling. At that point, the active learner then labels all the remaining images by itself. This is now a training process that does do deep learning, that does output a diagnostic model that labels the images in the sense of putting bounding boxes or semantic uh, shadings in of, of areas and outputs all of that. So now you have a fully labeled data set. The images you've manually labeled are of course labeled by, by you and your team. And all the other images are now labeled automatically by the active learner. Now you can't be sure that those auto labels are correct, of course, which means that you have to now audit them. So there's a process by which the human doctors now, instead of labeling, check that the automatically produced labels are accurate. If they are, everything's fine. If they're not, they might need to be adjusted a little bit. Once you're done with the auditing, now you have a fully labeled human curated and checked data set. You're done. Your data set is labeled fully, 100%. Now you can do the actual deep learning, right? Now you can do your auto ML that I've illustrated before with the feature engineering, the model selection, the hyperparameter tuning, and the actual training. You train your full model, and then you go to deployment. This entire workflow up here is active learning. And the point is to reduce the amount of human labor that flows into making something like this. Now, um, all these nice little boxes and arrows, um, you know, to actually make something like this practically in terms of software that's coded up, that's ready to use for, for real users, real doctors to go and look at images and label stuff requires a few um, little you know, software packages to be included. And um, sort of my team has put together a, a package that you know, includes a bunch of these things. So uh, we didn't write this from scratch. And so I just wanna acknowledge that actually carrying out something like active learning is not a trivial thing to do. And so we've, we've had to integrate a whole bunch of technologies like this to, to make it happen. Um, okay. Um, hi, Patrick. We have some quick questions from the chat box about this slide about okay. uh, how do you know the accuracy is good and regarding the accuracy, is it measured on the validation set? And another question, the accuracy is only for ranking or a combination, the ranking and label accuracy? Thank you. Those, those are really good questions. Um, so what we do at, at every stage in this, at every looping uh, of the active learning loop is we train the active learner not with all of the images that have been labeled in this manual step here, but um, only about 90% um, of those. The other 10% are kept back uh, from learning as a validation data set. And of, that of course grows with every loop, right? At, in the beginning of the loop, it's 10% of one batch. Uh, in the second loop, it's 10% of two batches. So it's double, double the validation size and so on. And so that grows over time. And it's that validation set that determines whether the accuracy is good or not. Um, and yes, the accuracy is something that assesses the correct ability by the active learner to reproduce the image label. So if, if the label is a bounding box, then it, are the four corners of the bounding box in the correct spots? Um, All right. So that, that's, that's the measure of the accuracy. Yeah, thank you. That's a very detailed uh, explanation. And then we, here comes another question. Dear Patrick, how can you make sure the list of labeled images selected by active learning is good is a good representation of the whole population. Ah, excellent. Um, it's not, and that's the point. Uh, so uh, the thing is that we are tempted uh, normally to label uh, the average image. Um, and of course we should label some average images. They are after all the average. Um, 
but the most informative images are typically the edge cases. Um, and so it's the very strange uh, images that are very different that typically provide most information in the beginning. Um, so uh, if you apply active learning, you will most likely find the most extreme cases in your uh, medical uh, data set coming out first. The extremely clean normal images and the extremely diseased, uh, you know, stage four cancers coming out first. Um, that's, that's what the active learning will look at initially is to detect difference. Um, and gradually then you work your way from the, the two extremes gradually to the middle and the average case. And then at some point you've hit them all and then your accuracy will be good and, and active learning is, is done. So it, it's really looking to be representative <clears throat> of the whole distribution and not, not, just the, uh, not just the middle. All right, thank you. So we have a few other uh, questions in the chat, but I think I'll let you continue and then we can answer them uh, if we have additional time at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Feel free to, to stop me. So just to give you a sense of what this looks like in practice, um, this is one, one example of going through this in a, in a real uh, case. Um, so on the vertical axis here, you see the accuracy that we just talked about. And on the horizontal axis, you see the percentage of labeled images. So of course, initially you have zero labels. And then as you progress with labeling, you get more and more labeled data sets. Um, the blue curve is the growth of accuracy if you label the images in a random order, so in the, in the usual way. Um, and the orange curve is the growth of accuracy if you label it with active learning. So you see active learning, the accuracy goes up and hits the maximum accuracy after 16% of images are labeled. This is of course an example. It's, it's gonna be different from case to case. But in this example, the accuracy hits the maximum accuracy that it's ever going to hit at 16%, which means the other 84% effectively don't really add any more information to the system. But if you label it in a random order, you see that there, there is some growth, some average growth over time but there's a, lots of up and down. And of course, you know, as data scientists, we're very familiar with that up and down of accuracy. Because if you encounter a few images that are quote unquote confusing to the AI, your accuracy will actually temporarily drop down. And so that's why one of the most popular ways to, to cure, quote unquote, a, a poor performing AI system is get more data, um, which is where the whole uh, big data myth started from. But actually, of course, our challenge today is small data because acquiring data is, is difficult and expensive. Um, so labeling it in the right order basically shows you here in this example, the, the growth of accuracy is it's much, much faster. Um, and uh, you can you can approach the, the full accuracy quite quickly. Um, so please to anybody in the audience, if you have questions about this, just throw them in the chat. Um, and um, let me just address the point of, of cost, right? Um, so I don't know how familiar everybody is in the audience with the cost of doing this. And so I, I felt it would be appropriate to give you a, a sample of, of the, the other side of the coin, the economics of all this. Um, so generally speaking, um, image labeling is done by a team of people um, and every image is labeled multiple times because um, each doctor makes a certain number of mistakes. Um, it's only human to, to error. And so usually between three and six people label every single image. So if you have 100,000 images, they're actually going to um, be 300,000 to 600,000 labels of those images, each one of which is produced manually. <clears throat> so it's a serious volume of work. 
And to produce a semantic label, in other words, the shading in of an area like you see here on the brain CT to find the tumor, takes between two to five minutes to make for every image. Uh, because of course you need, you need to be quite accurate and, and these sometimes tend to be very high resolution images. So that's a serious activity. On the other hand, if you're provided with an already existing label and all you need to do is check whether it's correct, typically it takes between 10 and 20 seconds to make sure that the label is, is accurate. Um, and this kind of auditing is usually also done by less uh, people, by one or two people instead of three to six, because of course something has already produced that label. And as you know, data set sizes are typically uh, large. In other words, 100,000 images and up all the way to over a million. Um, there are some data sets, of course, that are, that are smaller, but in AI, typically we go for the larger data sets. So if I use some, uh, let's say conservative assumptions about the amount of uh, images and the amount of labelings that I wanna do, which, which I put here in the, in the bottom, bottom right, I end up with a typical data set labeling project costing about $12 million. If you apply an active learning uh, utility to it, you shrink that down to about a million and a half. Um, so in a, in a particular case of an individual data set that needs labeling, um, active learning can provide a, a lift of, of 10 million and more. So uh, I just wanted to point that out to make sure that, you know, we're not talking about a toy, but we're talking about a serious, um, serious benefit that also frees up a, a great many people. So it's, it's, a, it's a saving in terms of time of the equivalent of 17 person years. Um, and and you, can, you can immediately see if you save 17 person years in medical data labeling, you free up 17 person years to take care of real human patients. Um, so there's, there's a serious upside on the, the healthcare as well. Um, let's look at an example um, of, of what that's actually happened. So these are smaller data sets um, that you know, we, we, we took care of just to sort of test uh, the system to see if it's working correctly. So uh, there is a data set of lung x-rays to detect COVID versus pneumonia versus normal lungs uh, that's av available on the internet. And there are uh, just over 15,000 of those images. And we found um, using active learning, only 915 of those had to be manually labeled. The rest could be labeled um, automatically. And that represents an automation rate of 94%. You know, 6% six, 6 had to be done manually. The rest could be done automatically. And the accuracy of that automatic labeling was 95%. Um, so that's actually a, a fairly high number for a, a medical case. Um, mind you, this is not yet the accuracy of the final AI model that you diagnostically deploy in, 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 in to, to help out real doctors. This is the model to help you label, right? So this is just an assistance tool. Um, on the other hand, we have this, this uh, case with colon cancers where we had 6,000 images and we only needed to label 500 of them to, to get to an accurate model. That was an automation rate of 92%, but the accuracy ended up being 100%. So every automatically labeled image was labeled correctly. Um, so you can see that you know, with this kind of technique, you can get really a very significant boost um, in, in your labeling efforts and, and be be quite accurate at it. Um, and uh, this is something that's that's been taken seriously in the industry, um, which has also grabbed the attention of market researchers. So uh, just to emphasize that that point um, that market researchers have have picked up on this, the uh, labeling market um, overall is, is quite large and specifically 
the labeling market in uh, medical imaging is is quite quite large. So depending on who you listen to and what kind of assumptions you put at the base of, of your, your market study, um, people come to different estimates, of course. And so here I, I just quoted four different uh, studies by market research companies about this kind of market. Uh, they come to different assessments on how valuable the market is, but it's, it's multi-billion dollar um, estimates in every single case, right? So just again, uh, bringing home the message that labeling medical data um, is something that, that is recognized to be, a, 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 you know, an up and coming market, very significant uh, market. Um, and so um, at this point, you know, having illustrated this, um, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to go into uh, answering any of your questions in a minute. Um, I just wanted to express an invitation to um, everybody on the call. If you are interested in doing something like this, um, I and my group were going through a, a scientific validation exercise. This is not commercial. It's not a pitch. There is no money involved. Um, it's purely science. Um, we're going through that scientific validation exercise to try to uh, learn more about how to do this correctly, about how to serve the medical community better. Um, can we apply to different types of data sets? So if you have a challenge in mind uh, where this might be useful to you, where it might be useful for you know, humanity and medicine as a whole, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out um, and, and we can look at it together. And um, if you would like more information, um, I'm sure we can find a way of distributing these slides to, to the audience after the talk. Um, here are a few links to, to resources on the internet. Uh, so first of all, there's a scientific publication that goes into uh, what I've talked about in, in a great depth of detail, um, including uh, the, the, you know, the algorithms and the resources to, to get the mathematics and the, all the open source tools that, that we use in the process. Um, uh, so if you're, a, if you're a data scientist or a mathematician, um, I'd encourage you to check that out. That, that'll, that'll give you a number of details. Um, if you're more interested in sort of a, a popular presentation towards maybe you know, management levels, then here are two popular articles. These are fairly short that I published on LinkedIn recently that, that we'll go into um, at, at the level that I've talked about today. Um, and there's, there's a little video uh, that we made as well that, that kind of steps through the process and actually shows you what active learning looks like in real life um, as you label, train, label again, train again, and the accuracy grows over time. And you can see what it actually looks like from a user's point of view. Um, so ultimately the message um, to you is, is this. All right. In medical applications, we need to label uh, a lot of data. That labeling is done by doctors. Um, these doctors need um, a long time to do that. And that process can be abbreviated by a technique that sorts the images um, again and again as the labeling process occurs. Um, and under the, 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 the label active learning, um, you can find a, a lot of resources that, that enable you to actually carry that out. So thank you very much for your attention at this point, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. All right, thank you very much for the very clear and, and elegant presentation. We have lots of, lots of questions in the chat box. Um, for example, one audience asked um, another question about accuracy. So say different doctors may label different boundaries. How would you take this variation into account? Excellent question. And this is exactly the reason why um, multiple people are asked to label every image because you do get that variation. Um, so there are two ways uh, to really deal with this. Um, no, I, I guess three, three ways. Um, first, uh, most popular way is to do a democracy system. Um, you get typically, as I said, three to six people to label. Um, and so if two people agree and the third one doesn't, then the two people are right. 
Yeah, that's that's the, the democracy voting way. Um, in the instance where everybody has a slightly different label, then you get another person and a kind of auditor individual to come in and make the call uh, to decide who is right and, and who isn't. Um, a third way is to bring all the labelers back and say, hey, this is what your colleagues did, you know, kind of discuss it amongst yourselves. Um, so it, it really is an organizational task, what you're asking about, rather than a mathematical task. Uh, the mathematics just discovers the fact that these labels are different, and it becomes an issue of project management of, of how you handle that. Ultimately, it is uh, the human process that needs to associate a specific label to a specific image and say this is quote unquote correct. All right. Um, there's another question about the technical detail about how to rank images for two examples, uh, X-ray and photograph. So the question is simply how do you rank images for these two uh, types of images? Right, okay, so the, the ranking algorithm that we implemented, first of all, doesn't depend on the type of image. Uh, so the algorithm is the same, whether it's a photograph or an X-ray or an MRI scan. It's, uh, as far as the computer is concerned, an image is an image. Um, and how we rank them is that uh, the, the act of learning produces a score for every image. So it has a model in mind um, and then basically calculates a probability that the model can accurately reproduce the label for that particular image. You can think of it uh, as something like a Bayesian uh, approach, um, which really uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the prior distribution is the manually provided labels. The, po the posterior distribution is the automatically produced labels. Um, and now the posterior distribution gives you a probability for every image as to how accurate the reproduction is. And that is then the ultimate sorting, right? The higher the probability, the better you are. And so you want to label the images with the low probabilities first. All right. Um, there's also another question about, well, there's only actually one question about your costly slide. So what is the cost to put this product in service? Do you need FDA approval for this uh, product and how much will that be? So uh, you do not need FDA approval for doing active learning because all you're doing is you're automating the labeling process. Um, this application of AI has nothing to do with diagnosing diseases or helping out doctors. Um, it's merely a human process automation. At the end of the day, every single label in the final data set is either manually created or manually audited. In other words, the entire data set um, has been checked by a person. Um, and therefore, the fact that active learning helped to make that process more efficient does not require approval. Um, so you're, you're you know, welcome to, to apply it immediately um, and still end up with a model that you can that you can use independently. Um, there are also a couple of questions about biases. For example, um, how do you deal with the imbalanced labeling issues, say fewer cancer cases? What do you, yeah. Right. So, um, of course, the best way to deal with, um, with that is to create a balanced data set in the first place. Um, so I spoke about that at, at, the, at the very beginning um, when, when I talk about the, you know, the whole workflow. Um, the communication step at the very beginning where we clear up exactly what we need to then acquire the data. It's at that point that that question ought to be addressed uh, to make sure that the data set is balanced. But if you're in the unlucky position where the data set already exists and it's not balanced, um, then what you need to do is you need to undersample the, the large um, class that you have 
and you need to oversample the small class. Um, because of course the AI system is supposed to differentiate between the two. So as far as training is concerned, you need to balance your data set. So there's a pre-processing step that creates that balance um, somewhat artificially mm -hmm. from your imbalanced data set. Now oversampling, you can do in multiple ways. You can either just simply choose um, images possibly multiple times from the small class or you can do that and add noise. Uh, that's a popular way of doing it, um, to add noise to, to each uh, duplicate selection in oversampling to at least introduce a little bit of variation into the system to uh, help with the overfitting problem that oversampling um, usually entails. All right, uh, this re reminds me of my sampling classes. Okay, so we actually have two uh, more kind of general question. So it's uh, related to active lear learning. We talked about the application to medical image labeling, but it, is there any other use besides image labeling uh, for your model? And uh, if this approach can be applied to other health data labeling challenges rather than medical image labeling, such as disease di diagnosis from cl clinical notes and lab results. Yeah, excellent question. Um, so yes, absolutely. Active learning can be applied to many more areas than I've illustrated here. Um, medical images is simply uh, the area that, that we have tr decided to focus on, at least for the time being. Um, you could apply this to many other kinds um, of data labeling tasks. Um, for example, text labeling is a, a very challenging task as well. Um, so you can imagine, uh, for example, your electronic medical record is made up not only of images, but it's made up of text uh, where the doctor has written down, um, you know, that, you know, you have certain symptoms and that you were given certain medication and whatnot. Um, if that were labeled as well um, over many patients, you could create algorithms to help the doctor write the text to help the doctor create prescriptions, uh, to help the doctor, what, what's called code treatments. In other words, uh, do the billing and accounting for the services that the doctor has provided to you. And those things uh, take doctors a very long time. They, they spend hours every day, usually uh, basically documenting what they've done with their patients so that they can properly uh, give them drugs on the one hand and, and, and bill, bill them on the other hand. So assistance with that is, is very valuable as well. So text data and image data both need a lot of labeling. Um, the, the next is audio and video data, of course. Um, there again, you, you have a, a huge number of, of applications, um, mostly outside of the, the medical field uh, where you can do that um, and, and really benefit the world. So in terms of data labeling, um, it's, it's a huge task in, in virtually every application of AI to make sure that you have the right labels and active learning can, can help with that. Right. Okay, so um, I think that's probably the so much for today. Um, and uh, thank you very much for answering both the uh, deep technical questions about today's topic as well as the general questions um thank you very much for being here and uh, i will actually collect all the questions in the chat box and send them to you afterwards and if you uh, can write to us we can then uh, pass them on back to our audiences so uh thank you everyone for being here today um if you have registered to our mailing list uh please look out for the email notification for the next seminar. And I wish everyone ha have a good day and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. It was Thank a pleasure you. being here. Yeah. Have a pleasure great weekend. Having you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.